Dear service member, there is no other way to say it. You are the few and far between. I know you don't see it that way. You've been trained not to. You've learned to serve like you've learned to breathe. It's part of who you are now. But it's the few and far between who work to utter exhaustion and then get up and do it all over again for the good of those they don't know. And it's the few and far between who follow orders given and the ones that will certainly come, who find the discipline to look beyond themselves into a future for those who aren't here yet. It's the few and far between who run toward danger, who help those who can't help back. Today, I want to honor you. Buy your lunch or coffee if I can. Stop and say thank you when I get a chance. Take the time to think about all who have made the ultimate sacrifice and pray continually for you and your family. It seems inadequate, even as I say it, but at the end of the day, you didn't sign up for the thanks, which is what makes you the few and far between. Thank you for your service. Good morning. We are so glad you are here with us today. And if you're joining us online, we are happy to welcome you to Park Plaza and our service today. Of course, this is the weekend where we especially remember, honor, and thank our veterans. And we will be doing that through our service this morning, but especially tonight. Our evening service is set aside um, to honor our veterans, and we hope you will come back for that. As we begin our time, I'm going to just ask that if you are a veteran in the room or in the fellowship hall with us today, would you stand so that we may recognize you and remain standing. We thank you so much for your service. Remain standing because we're going to join you. I ask if everyone stand as we sing the hymn about soldiers for the Lord. Stand up, stand up for Jesus.
morning. Welcome. We are glad that you're here this morning and thankful uh, for this time of Thanksgiving and for Veterans Day. We had uh, just a few items we wanted to share with you this morning. Our Christmas at the Plaza is rapidly approaching. There are tickets, uh, the fewer and fewer as we go, out at the counter by the nursery. And if you haven't received yours yet, you can check there. The times are listed in the center panel of your bulletin here. There's a card shower for Christana. She is a missionary with Asian women and children. Today is the last opportunity for that so we can get those over to her in Asia. I'm thankful for that. American Rehabilitation Ministry, also called ARM, is our prayer focus of the month. Also keep the people in the country of Israel and the whole situation in the Middle East. Several other prayer items there. We hope you lift those up. Would you bow as we open this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day to be in your presence. Thank you for the beauty of your creation as we drive and see the beauty and the color of the leaves. Father, we thank you for this season of thanksgiving. Lord, we do give thanks for those who have served our country, for our veterans, for those in our churches served. And Lord, we do pray for our armed forces stationed around the world that you would bring them home safely to their families and be with them in all that they do. Father, we lift up American Rehabilitation Ministry. We thank you uh, for them and their outreach to our prisons. Father, we pray for each of those on our prayer list. We do lift up the country of Israel and the situation in the Middle East. Uh, Father, we pray that you grant wisdom and guidance. Be with us in our service this morning. Be with Mark as he leads us in the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is amazing that for a church of our size, we have the number of veterans that we do have, and we are just honored to have every one of you. What is even more amazing is that there are some of you who can still fit into your uniform. <laughs> and we have, we have a couple at least represented that I've seen this morning in their uniforms. We thank you all for your service. On a spiritual level, we are all soldiers. Through our life, we have the mission of being soldiers for Christ. And there are often times in scripture where it compares um, the battle that we face on a spiritual level with the soldiers and their fight. And uh, we don't become retired or veterans in the spiritual battle until we breathe our last. We are um, enlisted um, as long as we're on this earth serving the Lord. I want to read a scripture. It's just a real short verse that's an encouragement to us um, as soldiers for the Lord from 1 Corinthians. This is in chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. And then it adds this, almost seems out of place, but it's so much in place. Do everything in love. And we'll be studying about that this morning, how we uh, strive to be united as a Christ church, and everything we do needs to be with charity, with love for others. We're singing songs about soldiers on the spiritual level, and so I hope you'll join us and be reminded that each one of us has a role to do as Christians. Uh, the first one in our medley is Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to
here on earth fighting the battle for, the, for Christ, we need reminders. We need ways that uh, um, encourage us and pick us up, remind us of the battle we face. Coming together as a congregation is such a wonderful way that we do that. But then partaking of the Lord's Supper together as his family and remembering what he did for us. That's a wonderful part of being a Christian and our Christian experience here. We started last week just kind of a trial period of a different way of partaking of the Lord's Supper, and that includes everyone receiving one of these uh, chalice cups as you come in. If you did not get one, as we're still trying to get used to that, I'd ask you to raise your hand, and John's back there, and he's going to uh, um, come and bring some over this way. Anyone else, if you did not get one of these as you came in this morning, we'll try to make those convenient so we can get used to picking those up while we're going through this period of seeing how this works for our time together. Um, the Lord's Supper is, is um, Christ's invitation for us to share in this way of remembering him. And so we encourage all Christians, whether you're a visitor here, whether it's your first time, or whether you've been here for 50 years, um, we want all Christians to know you are welcome to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. We will have a time of uh, singing a hymn, a song that reminds us of Christ's love for us, and then we'll have a time of meditation and prayer. Then I'll come back and I will uh, um, walk us through the procedure because we're going to partake again this morning in unison uh, the Lord's Supper, the emblems that he offers us to remember him by. So as we prepare our hearts, let's sing a song that talks about his love for us. Um, how much he loves us, he gave his life for us. Could not be any greater love than that. And then Curtis will come and uh, give us some thoughts to think on as we partake today. as Christians are part of a spiritual legacy brought about by the shed blood of our Lord and Savior. In Romans 11, speaking to the Gentiles, you and me, uh, in verse 17 it says, Now if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree. So briefly, I would like to explore our roots, going back to the Old Testament, the book of Zephaniah. And in the most part, I want the text to speak for itself. So Zephaniah. Zephaniah 1, 2 through 3. The horrible consequences of sin in a broken world. I will utter utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks, along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3. The call to repentance. Before the decree is issued, 
or the day passes like chaff. Before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Restore a relationship with God. Zephaniah 3, 9 and 10, and 14 through 17. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the, riv the rivers of Ethiopia, uh, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your health, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. And that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God, in your midst, the Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. So as we approach the Lord's table today, let's take a moment and reflect on that last verse. We serve a personal God of infinite might. We serve a God who saves. We serve a personal God of infinite comfort. And we serve a personal God who takes joy in you and me, his children. Let's pray. Almighty uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that through Christ's sacrifice, we are now and can be called children of God. Our glory to you forever and ever. Amen. As Curtis read for us, the Lord's anger is what we deserve. The Lord's restoration is what we receive. And this time we come together is to remember that through the emblems of his sacrifice. If you take your cup, the smaller end has the bread in it, and just peel that back. Hopefully you don't have trouble, but if you do, there are others around you that can help you with that. We're all family here, and we want to help each other as we partake. I'm going to read a passage of scripture, and then we will partake of the bread together. This is from 1 Corinthians also. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, and I just want to stop there. There's probably a reason why that is worded that way. The night he was betrayed. It doesn't say on the night he met with the twelve in the upper room. Um, it was the night he was betrayed. And each one of us have betrayed our Lord. We remember that, that his sacrifice was for us. And as we partake of these emblems, we're reminded through his body. The scripture goes on to re read, he took the bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we've done again this morning as we gather. 
the men will come passing the baskets and they will receive the empty cups. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we have the privilege of meeting here in your house. We're thankful for the many blessings that you give us. And Lord, as we know that you hear us when we pray, we thank you for listening. And this morning, may we listen to you as Brother Mark brings us your message from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever known of a time when the church got confusing? Uh, maybe it had to do with uh, the fact that um, perhaps uh, the person was new at church, hadn't been around church, wasn't used to church, and so everything was a little bit odd and new and uh, maybe confusing. I was speaking in Bloomington, Indiana one time at a congregation that was a vibrant church, growing church, really reaching a lot of lost people, people that had no background in church whatsoever, so everything was going to seem a little off to them and uh, strange. And when one guy was going out of the church building, he said to the preacher, how come those old guys sit up there and guard that table? 
Some of you might remember when we had chairs, you know, in the old days by the communion table and the elders of the deacons would sit and they would pray over the emblems. But to him who had never been to church before, you know, this was just odd. This was, maybe church is confusing because you're just new to it. Uh, maybe it's because something took place out of order. We actually had one thing out of order in the first service. One thing that's nice for y'all is we've had a trial run before you got here. And so we're going to eat it right, hopefully, in the second hour. But anyway, things take place out of order. Those of you with College Heights background or connections might remember the famous Joe Earhart Award that was usually, usually given in honor of Joe Earhart every year at the Thanksgiving dinner, which was rarely a Thanksgiving and not really a dinner, but that's a whole other story. But anyway, the reason it was given was because Joe Earhart one day in church got up and gave the offering meditation, which was really quite good. It was just, it was time for communion. He was totally off base. And he realized it when he got about halfway through his offering meditation and looked down here at all the guys standing up there with the trays for communion, like, uh-oh, and he just went and sat down. <laughs> so sometimes church is confusing because something got out of order and anybody who therefore from that point on muffed it at church got that next year, the Joe Earhart Award. That's how it worked. Maybe church is confusing to you because, well, maybe just the unexpected happens and it throws everything into a tizzy. Some of you might remember the name Grady Nutt. Grady Nutt was a Southern Baptist humorist. He's been called the prime minister of humor. He was killed some years back in a, a plane accident. Uh, but Grady Nutt used to be on, all right, I confess, I watched it, Hee Haw. Okay, shows you the level of my... Anyway, so uh, Grady Nutt tells the story. You might want to Google this this afternoon for a little bit of a giggle from the Google, you know, at halftime or something. But anyway, he tells the story about Mrs. Middleton takes the plunge. Just Google that. Mrs. Middleton takes the plunge. And it happens to be in one of those old church buildings, not like this one that has a nice stage area. You'll see the choir pieces here for tonight's service and the baptistry up high where everybody can see it. But in the old buildings, and I preached in one of these, you actually had the wall, the outside wall, pretty close to the sanctuary front of the stage. And that was the case here. So the baptistry was not up nice and high. It was, does anybody remember this? In the floor of the stage. Raise your hand if you remember a bapt. Yeah, several of you. And what they would do is they'd scoot the pulpit over. They would lift up the lid to the baptistry. And oh, behold, there's a tank there. And uh, it had steps down to it. Well, on this particular Sunday, so says Grady Nutt, with the story of Mrs. Middleton takes the plunge, two people presented themselves for baptism. Mr. Hawkins and Mrs. Middleton. And of course, they didn't have changing rooms like we have up behind me here. It was just the building as you saw it. And so, in fact, they would draw a curtain. It was held by an eye bolt into that wall and an eye bolt into this wall. And a curtain would bring, and one uh, wire coming down from the ceiling to hold it in tension. So when they had a baptism, they could have a changing room right in the sanctuary. The other curtain would be, uh, you know, a parallel to the audience, this one perpendicular, but they would bring it from the back wall and it would attach to that wire hanging down so that you could have a men's changing room and a woman's changing room. It works that way. Well, anyway, Mr. Hawkins got ready first and he came out, presented himself for baptism, went into the baptistry. The minister baptized him. Everything was well. He went to his changing area and then came in Mrs. Middleton. The only problem with Mrs. Middleton is she was deathly afraid of water. And she knew that this is what God wanted her to do, but she was still dealing with her fears as she came down every step and said, I just can't do it, I just can't do it, I just can't do it. And the preacher said through his clenched teeth, trust me, trust me, trust me. Anyway, she got in there and he said it was like baptizing a stump. I mean, she was just stiff as a board. And finally, he kind of just picked her up and body slammed her right into the water. Well... He said he was doing it for her own good, but she panicked and grabbed anything she could, which was the curtain. And as she's going under, she has the curtain with her, okay? And eye bolts come flying out of the walls. Wires are going everywhere. Curtains are falling down. And Mr. Hawkins is over here drying off, <laughs> revealed in all of his glory. And uh, had a little moonshine at the church that day. But anyway, uh, he turns around to see what's so funny. Well, it was a baptism like no other. 
sometimes church gets confusing because something very unexpected happens and throws the whole church a curveball. And sometimes it gets confusing because you live at Corinth. And Corinth was a confused church. They had a lot of things that made it confused. We've talked about a lot of those in this series as we've worked our way through this book that we've titled Undivided for Our Church, trying to learn how to be united from a divided congregation like Corinth. And we find ourselves today, interestingly enough, on Veterans Day weekend, when at least the military can show us how to do things orderly. The church wasn't doing things orderly. And we find them just in a mess. And by the time we get to chapter 14, which is the rather tough chapter that we're dealing with today, it's really about when church gets confusing. It kind of started in chapter 13. We'll go there today, but we need to just in summary fashion cover the 14th chapter today so that next week on Thanksgiving Sunday, we can say, thank God, chapter 15, for the resurrection. <laughs> That'll be good. But before all of the thanking God and the resurrection, we got to deal with this confusion. We really do. I want to remind you of two things as we start. And that's this. That first of all, this section is long and the background is paganism. This section is long. It covers chapter 12, 13, much of which we talked about last week. And then it comes to chapter 14 as well. And the chapters are long and they're involved. And some of the particulars are actually quite difficult to understand and, and challenging to interpret. Uh, but also the background is paganism. I want to remind you what I said last week. And that is, if you kind of take the modern, and I'm identifying positions now, I'm not talking about people. If you identify the modern Pentecostal understanding of this text and read it back into this, you will misread it. This is dealing with paganism and prophetic oracles that would predict your future and ecstatic utterances that was happening just a little ways north of Corinth in a place called Delphi. We talked about it last week. So the background is paganism, not our modern understanding of Pentecostalism. And I'm not, not speaking derogatorily there. I'm just identifying positions. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say as we come to this today is this, that this teaching that Paul is giving is corrective. So whatever you want to say about what's going on at Corinth, some things are not going on rightly or well. And he's trying to give some correction to it. So there's a couple ways we can go with that. The good scholar John R. W. Stott from the All Souls Church in London, an Anglican congregation. He was an evangelical, a single all of his life, passed away not too awful long ago. John R. W. Stott would say, well, then Acts, that deals with speaking in tongues in chapter 2, chapter 10, chapter 19, that should be our default setting because that's the way it's supposed to be done. These in languages that people could understand the gospel. But he says this is the corrective passage. So you don't use a corrective passage to indicate how it's supposed to be done. This is the correction to the abuse. Okay, I get that. That makes sense. After all, the word glosa, from which glosalelia, tongue speaking, comes, literally means the muscle in your mouth, your literal tongue, or it means a known human language. Now, it might be, as some scholars suggest, and I wonder about this when I read 1 Corinthians 14, is what's happening in Corinth different than what happened in Acts? It seems a little different to me. It really does. But there's another scholar by the name of Craig Keener. He teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, a little ways from Lexington, and he suggests that no, 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 even though this is a corrective text, we can learn how rightly to do things from a corrective text. So... Pay your money, pick your choice. I'm not exactly sure where to go. My default setting would be with Stott, but Craig Keener has helped me to understand some of my Pentecostal brothers and sisters and how they think a little bit more about this. And so I've tried to spread out my wings a little bit and learn. Here's what I think is going on in this passage, and that's this. Church gets confusing when edification and orderliness are not in place. That's what I came to tell you today. Church gets confusing when edification and orderliness are not in place. I don't mean by orderliness, stuffiness or formality that just misses the boat on just being warm and inviting and friendly. 
So let's kind of come to this if we can. Walking down through this, what would we see here? Well, I think the first thing, and I'm going to back up into chapter 13 to get this. The first thing we see is this. We get confused about the permanence of spiritual gifts. I want to alliterate this today just so it's portable and you can kind of take it home. But I think sometimes there is confusion about the permanence of the gifts. Were some of them just temporary for the early church? Or do some of them relate to us today? That's the $20 million question. And we have to go back up into chapter 13, the love chapter, to get some clearance on this. So if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Paul says, love never ends. That's good. As for prophecies, which would be inspired speech, they will pass away. Now, you know, in English, we have the active voice, the passive voice. And in Greek, they have what's called the middle voice, which means acting with relationship to itself. This is in passive voice. Paul is saying, as for these inspired speeches, there will come a time when they just pass away. They just will. Then he says this word, as for tongues, and I'm guessing my default setting says a known human language spoken miraculously by the power of the Holy Spirit, it will cease. The word actually is where we get our English word pause, but it doesn't mean pause, it means cease, it means stop. But this is middle voice. I don't mean to be too technical with this. It just means there's something within itself that will cause it just to dry up. Here's the next phrase. For as for knowledge, which would be, I think, special revealed knowledge, probably, it will pass away. Same as what he said about prophecy. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. That's what makes all of this hard is because predictive prophecy, especially that predicts the future, is always piecemeal and fragmentary. Fragmentary. We don't know what it means until it's been fulfilled. That's how it works. So he says, what about that? It's just in part. But when the perfect comes, I think those of you reading NIV, it might say, when perfection comes. Well, that's a, there's an awful lot on that phrase. He said, the partial will, be, will pass away. And then this illustration. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. And I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Well, some people did. We live in a culture of prolonged adolescence. And it seems like some people never grow up. But that's the illustration. Here's the second illustration. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Why do you say that? Because they didn't coat glass with mercury and have a mirror like we do. No, it was just polished brass. And sometimes when you looked at it, it was kind of like being at the carnival. Well, is that how I look? So it says, like a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully. Does that mean when you die, you're going to be omniscient like God? What's he talking about here? In what sense would you know some more sometime? He goes on to say, even as I've been fully known, God doesn't need a lesson on you. He's got you down. And then he says, so faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the mega, the greatest of these, is love. Now, what are we to do with this section? Well, one thing it says, of course, is what? Whatever spiritual gifts God has given you, for heaven's sakes, use them in love. It at least says that. But it also does address the issue of what gifts are temporary and what gifts are permanent. And basically, you've got three choices. Basically. Here's the first choice. It could be talking about the return of Christ view. The return of Christ. That the perfect is the perfect one. And when the perfect one comes, then these gifts will pass away. But since he hasn't come yet, that must mean that these gifts are still available today. And a lot of our brothers and sisters out there would take that to be what it means. And maybe that is what it means. One little thing to think about is that in Greek, we have the masculine endings and the feminine endings. And we have some neuter endings, which just mean things. Things, not people, but things. And this is in the neuter ending. And that's why NIV translated as they did. When perfection comes. So it might not be referring to a person. It might be referring to an event or a thing or a time or a... It's it's difficult to know. But one view is the return of Christ, that these gifts of tongues and prophets, they'll be in place until the second coming of Jesus. Well, perhaps. Another view is what you might call the perfect word view. The perfect word view. And what we mean by that is, this was written probably in 55 AD. The uh, whole 27 books of the New Testament probably are done at about 100 AD or so and collected. And so maybe it means when the word is complete. Some things were still just partial like he says in the text, and prophetic. And so they weren't all complete yet. And I would remind you of this. 
And that is the only other place in the Bible that talks about a mirror is James chapter 1. And the context is about the Word of God. Don't be just a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word. Don't just look at your face in the mirror and walk away and forget what you look like. So there in the context, it's talking about the Word, whatever the Word might be there, so maybe it is. Maybe when we got the New Testament completed, maybe in time, and this is what John Chrysostom in the early centuries of the church would say, that the sign gifts have pretty much passed away. I don't know. So maybe it's the perfect Word view. Maybe thirdly, there's another view of this, and that's what we might call the mature church view. The mature church view, that means when the church gains its feet, when the church matures, it no longer needs some of these gifts that it needed in the earliest days. Maybe the Bible's been translated into the language of the people. Maybe it's not cutting new ground ethnically, geographically, like in Acts 2 and Acts 10 and Acts 19. And maybe it just means as the church grows up, it doesn't need all of these certain miraculous sign gifts. And that would be make sense to the context because he says, when I was a child... I spoke as a child. So the child illustration kind of comes home here a little bit. So which is it? How are we to decide this as to what views are temporary and what are permanent as far as these gifts go? Well, I'm not sure I can solve it all for you, but let's try this. Let's take, for instance, the issue of medicine as an illustration. All right. Now, we have several models around our church, you know, not the only Christians, Christians only, a church to call home. If you're not dead, you're not done. Uh, here's one that I think I'd like to add to our list, and that is knees and hips are us. Because Larry and I have memorized the orthopedic floors in the hospitals here. We don't even have a look. We can just punch four at Freeman and know where we're going. Because uh, a lot of us, our parts are wearing out. And we're getting new parts. And what do they send home with you? A prescription. And maybe it's oxycodone or, you know, uh, uh, hydrocodone or maybe Percocet. or Those are opioids. Those are narcotics. But the goal is, the doc says, now, just stay ahead of the pain. You might have to take more than one of these. To, but, but the goal is, you don't keep taking them. The goal is to get you on just Tylenol as soon as possible, and pretty soon, nothing. So maybe there's value to this idea of temporary. Maybe some of the gifts were intended by God to just get the whole shoot and match kind of started, and then we would be off and running on our own. Maybe that's the idea of this passage. But we deal with the permanence of the gifts. Some things in the church, though, are permanent, aren't they? Some things in life are permanent. On July the 15th, this past summer, down in, I think it was Florida, the Kansas City Chiefs received their Super Bowl rings from their victory back in February. And you know the coach, Andy Reid. He's been married since 1980. He has five kids. His father-in-law baptized him in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Did you know that? But when he came out of the ceremony and all the guys were wearing their Super Bowl rings that they had just achieved and received, Andy Reid didn't have one on. And the media guys noticed it. And they said, hey, coach, how come you don't have your ring on? And he pointed to his wedding band. And he said, that's my Super Bowl ring. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> I bet he got something more than beans and weenies for dinner the rest of the, <laughs> the, rest of the week. Some things are temporary. Some things are permanent. Church gets confused when we don't understand about the permanence of some of the gifts. What else do we see in this passage? Well, when you get into chapter 14 and the first 25 verses, I'd kind of say it this way, that we get confused about, if you will, the purpose of the spiritual gifts. That's what really is the big picture here. We get confused about what's the purpose of speaking in tongues? What's the purpose of prophecy? Why does Paul prefer one over the other in this passage? To give you a little flavor of this, let me just read the first six verses here of chapter 14. Pursue love. That's good advice, isn't it? The Greek word dioko means to hunt down like an animal. Hunt love down and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Nothing wrong with that, I guess. Especially that you may prophesy. Now that's a little weird because in chapter 12, it's almost like Paul levels these things and puts all the spiritual gifts on level ground, though he does at the end of chapter 12, order them first apostles, then prophets, thirdly teachers. There is some ordering of them. Why does he prefer prophecy over tongues? He goes on to say, For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Why would that be true? Now, don't think of the modern-day movement. 
think back to Corinth. What did people speak at Corinth? I'll tell you, Latin and Greek. So if you come into the assembly and you speak Spanish, no one's going to understand. It's as if you're speaking to yourself. And only God would know what Spanish means in that case. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries of the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies, speaking a language people do get, speaks to the people for, get these three words, under uh, building, encouragement, and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue just builds up himself. Oh, he might be delighted that he's using his spiritual gift from God, but nobody's being edified. And he goes on to say, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you to all speak in tongues. The word want is the word thelo, and it just means wish. I sort of kind of wish you could all do this like I do. Paul will say later in the chapter, he speaks in tongues more than anybody else. But he says even more that you would prophesy. The one who prophesies is actually greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless somebody interprets so that the church is... This sounds like a broken record, doesn't it? So the church is built up. Now, brothers, you'll notice it's plural, so it refers to the sisters as well. If I come to you speaking in tongues, how would I benefit, the word means profit you, unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? What's going on? Paul is emphasizing the purpose of these gifts. And I can tell you this, if you just do an inductive study through this chapter and you look at for all of that language of building up the church, you will see it in verse 3, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 6, in verse 12, in verse 17, in verse 19, in verse 26, in verse 31, and verse 40. Are you a little overwhelmed by that? Those verses all say, unless you're building up the church, you might want to think twice about the use of those gifts. He goes on in this chapter to talk about musical instruments like the flute and the harp. They're supposed to sound distinct notes, you know. Uh, it, it's like a saxophone that they don't quite get there and hit it. It's like, ah, can't stand this. Uh, in regard to like today and our service tonight, the Veterans Weekend, wow, I mean, you've got this idea of a bugle and the soldiers won't know it's time to march to war unless it sound distinctly. He goes on to talk in the chapter about how can people, if they enter your assembly, how can they say amen if your speech is that of a foreigner? The Greek word actually means barbarian. Hmm. He gets a little farther down and he says, and this is what was very much happening in Delphi, that they would kind of use these drugs and they would get these ecstatic utterances going on because uh, that, that would supposedly give them their future of what it was supposed to look like, their life. But here's the problem. Here's the challenge is they would disconnect their mind from their spirit or their prayer life or their songs. And Paul says, I'm going to sing with my spirit. I'm going to sing with my soul. I'm going to, I'm going to pray with my mind. In other words, Christian meditation or Christian use of gifts never bypasses your brain. God uses your created mind and your redeemed mind in Christ to have you do what you need to do. He goes on to even say that there will be times when unbelievers come to your assembly. We have, we have people that, that come here at Park Plaza kicking the tires, checking us out, seeing what we believe. Happens just about every Sunday. And some will say, he goes on to say, how will they understand anything if everything's just foreign to them? How will they be able to say the amen? How will they be able to fall down and say, wow, God is there? They would declare that. So the point is, we have to get this purpose right we have to get this purpose right. Will people know that God is at our assembly because everything was clear to them, regardless of the use of your gifts? So when I go to the YMCA in the mornings and back home, I go the back way down Lone Elm Road and Maiden Lane down to the Y. And there's a Pentecostal congregation there on Lone Elm Road. And I kind of like what they have on their sign. It says this, come visit us. God does. Well, yeah, God does, because he's everywhere, so he will visit you. But if he's the only one that can understand what's going on in church, church is confusing. He understands it because he's God. But our goal is that they would understand it as well. So let's not forget that. Um, read across a new book by Andy Reese called The uh, Spiritual Gifts uh, Blueprint. And he had this chart in the book, and I thought, you know, I think that's sort of accurate. 
I think as he looked at Christendom and he looked at all of us out there that would claim the name of Jesus, he came up with this, this chart, this spectrum. You'll notice on the left side, and by the way, we're not saying anything left or right about politics here. But on the left side is the Pentecostal or the charismatic understanding that these gifts are all still in place. On the right side would be the cessationist group. A lot of our folks might fall into that, but we're not alone with that. People from Dallas Theological Seminary and a lot of other places are kind of in that spot. And he would put the, con the conservative denominational churches, more than that, that these gifts have passed away. Of course, then the question you have to ask is, if they've passed away, then what are some of our friends doing? But notice where he puts our little tribe. Right smack dab in the middle. Non-denominational. Along with some evangelicals. What that means is that some of us to say, I think these sign gifts were just for the early church. And others of us would say, I don't think so. I think God can still release them. And if the trajectory of Acts needs any kind, if you'll follow me for just a minute, here's what I notice when I look at the only three uses of speaking in tongues in the book of Acts. Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. The original Pentecost, the Gentile Pentecost, and Asia Minor Pentecost. And what makes those unique is that they all have different nations and languages and uh, people groups that are part of those uh, situations. And I guess my thinking is, I guess God can do anything he wants through his spirit. So if he wants to release the gift of tongues today, he certainly can. But if the trajectory of Acts means anything at all, maybe he will do it when they're out there cutting new ground. Like a missionary cutting new ground with people that have never heard the gospel before. I don't know. That's just where I am. I just think that we better not ever forget this idea that whatever gifts we use, the purpose of them is to edify the church. And if the church is not edified, something's really wrong. I was reading about these guys from a fraternity in a small town in North Central, uh, North, uh, North Carolina, up in the central part of North Carolina, I should say. And uh, these, they're a smaller town, but it didn't have a college there. So these fraternity guys were participating in the Christmas parade. Of course, the churches had made their floats, and they came by, little manger scenes, Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus, you know, all that, very nicely done. Others were celebrating Christmas, here's Santa Claus and his elves, and elf on the shelf, and all this stuff, and so that was coming by. Then there was one, rather late in the parade, just a hay wagon pulled by a tractor. That was pretty much it, just a hay wagon pulled by a tractor. And it had the sign on the side of the fraternity name from the college, from the local college. And people kind of wondered about this. And as the float got by, then they saw the fraternity boys on the back of that float, the back of that hay wagon. And they were sawing boards and hammering boards and sawing boards and hammering boards. And below them, it had this sign. We thought the parade was next week. <laughs> I guess they're still working on it. Let's not be like the fraternity boys. Let's not forget something that's sort of crucial if it doesn't build up the church. Which kind of brings us to this last section, chapter 14, verses 26 to 40. We get confused when we don't follow the protocol for the church. Paul starts laying out some ground rules here. What are the protocols for the church? What, how do we make these judgments? Even if we don't, can't decide, is this really a language? Is this ecstatic utterance? What this is? What's prophecy? Is it capital P, small p? D.A. Carson, thank you very much. What, what's this mean? Well, we've got to still follow the protocols. And here's one of the protocols. When you come to church, bring something. You didn't have to bring a bull today. You didn't have to bring a calf today. You didn't have to bring a lamb today because of the finished, complete work of Jesus Christ. But did you bring a song? Did you bring a revelation? Did you bring a prophecy? Did you bring a tongue? Did you bring, did you bring a cheerful spirit? Did you bring, church is not a spectator sport. You're to bring something. That's one of the protocols. Second, if you do bring tongues, there's a protocol. Whether you understand them as ecstatic utterances or real languages, there's a protocol. You only have two, or at the most three. You let them speak in turn, in turn, in, in, uh, you know, turn. And then thirdly, you also have to have an interpreter. That's the protocol. And if you have a prophecy, if there's a prophecy, then there are rules for that. There's protocol for that. There's ground rules. And it is, you go ahead and speak. But the other people there get to weigh what you said. 
And I love this little line that Paul gives us. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. I can't get up here and just spout off with anything. You have to be like the Bereans and check me out to see if what I'm saying is the truth. So I get nervous when people say, well, the Lord told me. Well, okay, but what what did he tell you? He said, you're supposed to give me 20 bucks. Well, why didn't he tell me? And I get nervous when people say stuff like this because if the Lord tells you one thing but the Lord told the whole church something else, who am I supposed to believe? The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. There's protocol. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I have to give you this lesson of Greek. In verse 28 and in verse 30, it uses the word sigao, sigao. Sigao means be quiet, silent. He says, if you're speaking in tongues and you don't do the follow the rules with two or three and an interpreter, then sigao, quiet. If you are bringing a word of prophecy and the other people there weigh it and see if that, what about its truthfulness, if they can't buy in on it, then sigao, quiet, which gets us ready for the next section. Because there's a little paragraph here in this section that talks about the married women in the assembly. Now, this is not about just any woman. So when he says, as is my rule in all the churches, let a woman keep silent in the church. Okay, You have to remind your, mind yourself, in chapter 11, he already gave us the protocol for how women speak in church with, a, with the veil and whether they're praying or prophesying, some kind of covering to indicate submission. He's already, so this is not about just women. Okay, But evidently, whether it goes with that paragraph or the previous paragraph with tongues or prophecy, this was more than just Corinth. It was, as is my rule in all the churches. I guess that would relate to Park Plaza. So what's he really saying? He deals with the married women. And I almost, I almost brought a slide today of the synagogue at Magdala. But that's in Israel, not in Corinth. That's clear across the Mediterranean. Okay? The reason I did is because in the synagogue at Magdala, you can see where the men sat and where the women sat. The church I preached at in Illinois had two doors into the sanctuary. And in 1852, when they were built, guess what walked in each of those doors? The men went on one side, and the women went on the other side, and the men had their standard international lesson back there, and the women had their standard international language up here. That wasn't chauvinistic. It was just how it was done those days. It's just that's how they did it. Well, what's happening evidently in the church is there's confusion because the women are seated, the married women in particular are seated, different than their husbands, and so they didn't have a PA system. So Ethel... I always pick on her. Ethel is up there in the balcony, and she said, Hey, Harry, what did he say? <laughs> and Harry says back, The deaf women shouldn't come to church. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> if it's Ethel and Harry, it's causing confusion. So Paul says, Good grief, ladies. Sagao. It's not any different word than what he used about the tongues and the prophecy. He's not trying to clamp women's voices in church. That's not the point at all. What he's trying to say is, hey, if you didn't hear it or didn't understand it, don't cause confusion. Just ask your husband when you get home. So we finally get down to this kind of in verse, the last part of the chapter, verse 33, or 36, if I could come to that. He says, or was it that the, from you the word of God came? Or are you the only ones to whom it's reached? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. It was a legitimate gift of God. But all things should be done decently and in order. And that's why I say to you today that church gets confusing when edification and orderliness are not in place. Raise your hand if you've ever read a book by Max Lucado. <laughs> Look at these hands. A lot of you have. This boy that grew up on the mission field in South America down in Brazil and ended up being a Church of Christ preacher down in Texas. Went to school at Abilene Christian University down in Texas. His roommate was Rick Ashley. He's a well-known name out there. And one day he was on a radio podcast program with Ed Stetzer. I'll come back to him in a minute. But in that interview, 
Ed Stetzer said to Max Lucado, do you have anything else you want to say to us? He said, well, actually, one day I was reading, and he referred to our passage today, where it says, pursue love, but earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And he said, I just said, God, are there any gifts that you have for me that I haven't asked for? If so, please give them to me. And he began speaking in tongues. Max Lucado. Ecstatic utterances, I think, what he would understand as opposed to a language, but he said this. Ed Stetzer, who's been to Ozark Christian College to speak and very knowledgeable about our little tribe, he was up till just recently the distinguished Billy Graham Chair of Missions and Evangelism at Wheaton College, and he moved this last summer to be the Dean at Talbot School of Theology in Biola University. And Ed Stetzer said, Max, Max, you are a member of the American Restoration Movement, the Christian churches and churches of Christ. This is not what a lot of your people believe. You're saying that you spoke in tongues? And Max affirmed that he did. I don't have a box for that. I don't know what to do with it. But if I stay true to where Andy Reese said I am, I'm in the middle someplace. And what I guess I would say to you about that is, maybe we need a new motto. Can I give you one more? A few weeks ago I said, one, one, one. You know, imitate me as I imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, one. How about this one? Clarity with charity. Let's be as clear as we can. Because this is about Jesus and the church. We don't want anybody to be confused. We don't, want a, we don't want a lost person to not understand the things of God. We want them to be clear. But that may necessitate us being very charitable to people who might understand spiritual gifts a little different than we do, perhaps. I don't know. But that would be my plea today. As I mentioned earlier, here we find ourselves on the Veterans Day weekend. Very special thing, as Marshall mentioned, proportionally, exponentially, we have a lot of veterans for a church our size. And we will honor them tonight, as we did a little bit this morning. But uh, with the military, there's an orderliness. There is an orderliness. And without it being stuffy or overly formal, that's how God wants his church to be too. So that things will take place in the right way. Let's not make it confusing. If you have a public decision for Jesus Christ today, we urge you to make it. I'll be right here to greet you. Will you as a church right now stand on your feet and let's sing together our song of consecration about the Lord taking our lives and using them with our gifts for him. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be. seated for just a second before we leave today. We are very fortunate today in our morning service to have our guest speaker who's on for tonight to be here. And that is Dr. Cal McAlexander and his wife Cindy. Cindy, raise your hand up so they know you're up here. Cal, come on up here. He's going to be in uniform tonight. And yes, as Marshall mentioned, <clears throat> if you can be in yours, good luck. And uh, <laughs> so... He has agreed to be in uniform tonight, but this is Dr. Cal McAlexander. He is the executive director for the Chaplaincy Endorsement Commission of the Christian Churches and Churches of Christ. And he, did I get it right? Yeah. Okay, got it right. 
And he, he, uh, he uh, lives, he and Cindy, in Warrington, uh, uh, Virginia. That's just south and west a ways of the nation's capital. And so he's uh, done all kinds of things. You ought to see the long list of, from jumping out of airplanes to you name it. This guy has done it all. But he helps with the chaplains of our tribe, you know, for the military. And boy, that's an important important job. So we're so glad that he and Cindy were kind of en route to Oklahoma City to the International Conference on Missions and could be our speaker, our special guest speaker. I've asked Cal to uh, give our benediction. Let's stand together. Dr. Cal will lead us in our benediction and then we'll sing our way out. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you humbly today, Lord. We love you. Uh, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to worship, for the many blessings that you give us, for the way that you work in our lives. Uh, Lord, today we want to pray especially for the veterans. Uh, Lord, bless them for their service. Uh, we pray for those that are on active duty in the reserves and especially for those that are in harm's way, Lord. Uh, protect them and watch over them. Uh, we pray for our leaders and, and for us as uh, individuals that you would give us the wisdom of Solomon, the courage of David, the uh, faith of Daniel, and the inside of Isaiah as we make our decisions and go about our daily lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And the church said...